Hi, everyone. Well, it's back to Africa. In part five of this unit on post-colonialism, we need to make sure that we at least try to understand Africa a little bit better. Now, remember, compared to all these other areas, we're talking about a continent here. And so everything that we are trying to say, the scope of it has to be uh, increased so much that we can only just kind of dabble and touch on some of the things that seem to be patterns as Africa emerges from colonization through revolution into the post-colonial existence that many African nations are still experiencing today. And so when we think of post-colonialism, it may be Africa that we need to think about most consistently because African nations are still struggling with power vacuums that continue to pop up and dictators that seek to fill them. And so let's talk about Africa. And you need to know that today Africa means shadows of injustice. Now there's a phrase that's been used to describe the heart of Africa over the centuries, especially over the last two centuries. And this has to do with the fact that uh, most of the world was known to Europeans by the middle of the 1800s, by the middle of the 19th century. But Africa was a tough nut to crack. That's what Europeans believed. Part of this had to do with malaria and the fact that uh, when Europeans went to Africa, they could start colonies and they could start exploration, but so often it was just futile because uh, the, the people there, the settlers, would contract malaria and many, many would die from that disease. With the discovery of quinine, it was like magic, a magic medicine. It didn't cure malaria, but it lessened the effects and it gave the, the body's natural immune system time to overcome that disease. And so quinine was the reason that uh, Europe and particular, in particular England was able to uh, get involved in Africa in a new way and to penetrate the interior of Africa. But because the interior of Africa, and specifically we're talking about the Congo and the, the tropical rainforest areas, because that area had not seen uh, European settlers, uh, there was the perspective that Europeans were invaders and they had to be met with resistance. And also for the Europeans, there was the idea that those groups of people who are on the interior of Africa, that they were very uncivilized. They were very different from Europeans. Uncivilized, again, is a name, a way that Europeans were able to put down peoples and claim the right to educate them and teach them about civilization and really to enslave them over the centuries. And then that continued through colonization as Africans were less educated and they were given the, the most menial jobs and basically treated as slaves in their own country. Well, let's talk about the heart of darkness. Heart of Darkness is the title of a book by Joseph Conrad, and it was written uh, at the beginning of the 1900s, and it was a book about colonization, specifically in the Belgian Congo. And the Belgian Congo was really L King Leopold II's Congo. We've already discussed this, so I won't get into a lot of detail. Just know that the King of Belgium had a chunk of Africa that was basically his own personal colony. and. He could do whatever he wanted to, and the goal was to make money. And so the Africans there were treated terribly and uh, were left to suffer the effects of, uh, you know, building railroads through mountains and, and those explosions that they needed to get through the mountain. It would, it would cause African workers to lose limbs. So the heart of darkness was a book that exposed that. It exposed the treatment of Africans, but unfortunately the author, Joseph Conrad, also revealed that 
there, there was racism in looking at Africans in general. Uh, maybe there was this idea that if you allow Europeans to take advantage of you like this, you must be below Europeans. And so a terrible racism existed and it was shown by the Belgians and it was also shown by the author himself as a European looking at this situation. And one of the main products that was coming out of the Congo area was ivory. Um, and so there was there, uh, this great trade in ivory and it was worth it for Europeans to risk getting malaria and uh, to fight against any groups that were opposing them. And remember, the Europeans had far superior weapons, including machine guns. And eventually it was there was no way that the Africans could resist. Let's fast forward now and talk about what happened during World War II, because we forget that during World War II, Africa was actually a very important battleground. Uh, remember that after the scramble for Africa, uh, Africa had been cut up into European colonies. And when things started heating up among the countries of Europe during World War II, that led to uh, war in the colonies. Now, the main place that we see war during World War II in Africa was in North Africa, and we've discussed this a little bit. So just know that the, the main battles happened between the British and the Germans and the Italians. Now the Italians uh, started out as wanting colonies in Africa. They invaded Ethiopia. They had taken over Libya. And because of that, uh, you know, that they were aggressors in World War II and they had a fascist government, a government led by Mussolini, who believed in the destiny of the Italian people, very similar to Hitler in Germany, believing in the destiny of the German people. And so because of those common beliefs, they worked together as the Axis powers and, and Japan also connected with them as an Axis power. And so uh, mainly, what was happening is a, a tank battle, a tank war that happened in the desert in North Africa. Remember that North Africa is largely the Sahara Desert, uh, other than the coasts. And so uh, the two generals that you need to know are General Montgomery, the general from the British, and General Rommel for the Germans. And they had many famous battles. Uh, maybe the most famous is uh, the two battles that took place in El Alamein in 1942. And uh, there was another battle earlier that actually the Allies had won in 1941 called uh, the, uh, the Crusader War. And that was a victory by the Allies and kind of gave them a boost because they had been suffering so many defeats from Hitler in Europe and things look pretty desperate. And so in many ways, the battles in North Africa served to turn the tide of the war that the Allies were losing. Remember in 1940, the French had totally lost to the Nazis and, and that was a, a terrible thing for Britain who thought that they were next and the Battle of Britain really tested the British people when uh, London and, and every, all the other cities in, in England were being bombarded by the Nazis. Uh, so the it, North Africa then uh, suffered because of that uh, being the battleground during World War II. And those scars are a part of the heart of darkness, if we're going to use that term. Remember, we're not using it in the same way that maybe Joseph Conrad, the writer, used it. We're talking about the suffering that Africa has had to endure largely because of European invasion and colonization. This is also true on the other side of Africa, South Africa. Now that goes all the way back and we've discussed this a lot uh, to the Portuguese exploration along the coasts of Africa and then the Dutch right behind and the Dutch basically continued to grow the colony in South Africa, the colony at the Cape of Good Hope. Remember, that was a major supply point uh, as uh, Europeans tried to go around Africa to get to the, the riches of the East and the spices that they wanted. And so the Cape of Good Hope was kind of a refueling station. And uh, it was during the time of Napoleon that that colony changed hands from the Dutch 
to the British. Remember, the British fought against Napoleon and the Dutch, unfortunately, the Netherlands fought with France. And as a result, Britain wanted to get revenge and get, get that colony from the Dutch. And so they took over. And that led to the conflicts we've already discussed uh, between the British colonists and the Afrikaners, who were the Dutch who had been settled there for a long time. And there were also French and Germans who were mixed in there. And they spoke a special language of Afrikaans, and it was basically kind of a Dutch uh, derivative. It came from Dutch, but it was this identity of people who believed they were Africans too. Uh, that they had been born there and their parents had been born there. And so uh, the Afrikaners, the Dutch speaking peoples and the British, they ended up fighting the Boer Wars and eventually the British did overcome them. But uh, that became South Africa and a, the union of South Africa means the Afrikaners, the Dutch uh, descended peoples and the British having a union. Now it's very similar to what happened in the United States. Uh, we talk about the Great Trek, which was when the Afrikaners knew that they couldn't stay where they were because of the British taking over the colony, and they trekked, like Star Trek. They moved thousands of miles and they resettled. Well, of course, they were taking over the indigenous people's lands, the lands of the Zulus, for example. And so they came into conflict and they were in covered wagons, very much like the American settlers going west across the, the uh, you know, the Great Plains and, and settling. So it's very interesting that South Africa had a similar history. They also had the history of slavery or at least the treatment of uh, African peoples, native African peoples, meaning black Africans. And the, the Afrikaners, the Dutch speakers, the Afrikaans speakers, they had a culture that put down the black Africans and the British had, uh, they had actually declared slavery to be illegal throughout their empire in 1833 uh, because of William Wilberforce and uh, Amazing Grace, which is an amazing movie to watch and know his story and the story of the song Amazing Grace and John Newton. Uh, just know that because British declared slavery illegal, they had a very different idea. It's very similar to the Northern states and the Southern states before the Civil War. Well, what this led to was uh, in, in the 1910s and then on into the 1940s, kind of a parallel of what happened in the United States. In the 1910s and 20s and 30s and 40s in the United States, there was the development of Jim Crow laws, which created segregation, separating black people and white people in the United States. In South Africa, you had the policy of apartheid, apartheid, was separateness, apartness. And that continued all the way until 1994, when we discussed this earlier with revolution that finally Africa, South Africa became, uh, gained a government that was controlled by the majority rather than just the white minority and apartheid was abolished. So that's another part of the heart of darkness. This discrimination against black Africans by the colonists, the European white-skinned colonists. Now I want to talk about something that happened in my history, my lifetime, and uh, this is the Ethiopian famine that mainly happened between 1983 and 1985, but it's something that has been recurring. And you should just know that this is something that happens throughout Africa because of uh, climatic effects, you know, the climate changes and you have droughts. Yes, that's part of it, but also political mismanagement and fighting between groups, especially groups that were uh, allies with communists and groups that were allies with Western powers. And in the 1980s, that was very much a part of everything happening in the world. You had the USSR versus the USA, and all countries in the world generally lined up with one side or the other. And that tore Ethiopia apart. It created a situation where people who just wanted to have food to eat, they didn't have food. And uh, the Ethiopian famine was actually something that inspired people in the United States and Europe, all over the world, 
to give to Ethiopia and try to help the people there. And it started with a man named Bob Geldof. He was a musician. He had a couple of hit songs, but he clearly had an understanding of the bad things that were happening in the world and how even one person can start to make a difference. And so he created a song called uh, Do They Know It's Christmas? And it was it's a song you'll still hear on the radio today. And it's about this famine in Ethiopia that was taking the lives of hundreds of thousands of people, even a million people. And uh, so there, that one song raised $8 million. And then there was a follow-up concert organized again by Bob Geldof. Uh, and he was able to raise $150 million through that uh, huge concert that was on more than one continent and included amazing performances by groups like Queen and U2 and uh, David Bowie and people like that. So just know that that was a cultural phenomenon. And then kind of the one that many people know is USA for Africa, a song written by Michael Jackson and uh, uh, Lionel Richie, We Are the World. That was able to raise another uh, almost $50 million and uh, you know hundreds of millions of dollars if you think of uh, inflation and what it would be worth today. So that famine and other famines have left scars. The inability for the African continent and its countries to feed their people because of political unrest and climatic changes. You also have political disruptions created by coups. We mentioned that in the last unit. Coup d'etat, a taking over of the government, usually by military leaders. And so famous dictators came to power. Uh, Idi Amin in Uganda during the 1970s. Mobutu Sese Seko in Zaire. Uh, Muammar Gaddafi in Libya. And Hussein Habre in Chad. These are four dictators you need to know, and the hundreds of thousands and even millions of people who were killed by them as a result of their dictatorial leadership. Uh, they ruled for decades in many cases, although we said Idi Amin mainly during the 70s. Oddly, he was, he was uh, lining up with the West and even Israel, which was a big deal, and there was actually a hostage situation and, and uh, rescue that happened. Uh, that was connected to Uganda, but uh, just know that he eventually switched to be aligned with Gaddafi in Libya and Seiko Se 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 in Zaire, and basically the, the communist-leaning uh, countries. And these countries in Africa, they basically lined up with whoever they could get support and aid from. And so... That's a big part of that story. Gaddafi was ruling in Libya and especially during the 80s. There was a huge threat that Gaddafi could spread his rule into Chad. And so the United States actually helped through the CIA. They helped to get Hussein Habre to be the dictator there for 30 years. And he ended up killing 40,000 people. So we need to know that the United States sometimes secretly through the CIA, but often openly, we would support these groups to fight against the Soviet Union, against the USSR, but we basically turned our eyes from the evil that they were doing. Now, finally, we need to talk about Ebola and uh, AIDS, two diseases that have just been uh, scourges in Africa. And Ebola has largely broken out from the Congo. Uh, again, tropical rainforests, you have all kinds of conditions that might lead to uh, diseases and outbreaks. And so Ebola has broken out in what was called Zaire is now the De Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, and it's broken out a couple of different times. It also has broken out more, more recently in West Africa. And so these new outbreaks are always so dangerous and difficult to control. There is no cure for Ebola at this time. 
Uh, there are ways to treat it, but even the people who treat Ebola, sometimes those people are moved to the United States to be treated, and then their nurses have gotten Ebola, so it's a terrible, terrible thing. And also the disease can mutate, it can change, and then there's no way to stop it. Uh, and it kills people so quickly and explodes uh, and is so contagious. Uh, AIDS has been terrible for Africa and specifically South Africa and the tiny kingdom inside of what looks like South Africa. You have these uh, little countries. One is Swaziland, uh, the kingdom of the Swazi uh, kingdom, it's called now. And AIDS has killed so many of the adults that now you have orphans, this incredible population of orphans left behind because both parents have died from AIDS. This is something that we must understand as we consider Africa in the post-colonial period. So even though they're independent, even though they should be free to choose their own leaders, their leaders fight, they have political fights, uh, they fight over the resources and many times like South Africa, there's so much wealth to be had. In Congo, there's oil. In Libya, there's oil. Nigeria, there's oil. But the resources are uh, caught up in the hands of a few people who become extremely rich. And sometimes it's the dictators and political leaders who become rich. And then there are so many people who starve and are so poor. Let's remember the heart of darkness as we pray as we are inspired to give to these places, I pray that you will be inspired to uh, bring light to this, this place that has been suffering. And largely it's because of other people's power. We're going to talk briefly because that last video was quite long for an introductory video, but there was so much to cover and now we'll be able to move a little bit quicker. We're going to talk about Congo again specifically and the relationship between Belgians and French and the Congo. Remember, these countries had been uh, civilized. They had uh, infrastructure created by the colonizers. But that didn't really help the local people during the time of colonization. It was just a way to move the resources so that the European countries could grow richer. And so King Leopold had a very dark legacy. Uh, your other European countries kept crying out about this. But the sad thing is those, those countries like the UK, they were doing many of the same kinds of things, especially in South Africa. Uh, you had uh, Cecil Rhodes, who was trying to gain control of the Kimberley Diamond Mines and the gold fields and would take over the Afrikaner territory like the Transvaal. Uh, and you will read about that. And just know the same kinds of things are happening. So when southern and northern Rhodesia were created in honor of Cecil Rhodes, it was just this march of colonization and uh, so Cecil Rhodes was maybe the most notorious colonizer next to King Leopold II. So Congo eventually gained its independence through those waves of independence movements we talked about and revolutions. The problem is they gained independence suddenly and they hadn't prepared for it. Uh, in, in Congo uh, and you know that Congo had a French Congo and a Belgian Congo, and it, it eventually became two countries. And it's difficult to identify, and they get confused because uh, both sides have been called the Republic of Congo over time. So uh, it's important to know that uh, they often, their, their conflicts spilled over into one another. So the forces, military forces from the French Congo invaded the Belgian Congo and vice versa. And uh, eventually there was a Congo crisis. So this happened because of uh, two men, two men largely. So it's not important that you know all of the names, but you should know L Lumumba and Mobutu. Lumumba and Mobutu. So 
after 1960, June 30th, 1960, uh, the country that had been ruled by Belgium, it became its own country. And it was, at first, it was the Republic of Congo. Later, it would become Zaire. And today, it's called the Democratic Republic of Congo. Okay? So, mainly, we're talking about that country. Uh, the other country today is known as the Republic of Congo. So that was the French Congo that eventually became the Republic of Congo. So uh, what happened is there were there was infighting and disagreements between the premier and the, the I should say the president and the prime minister, the president and the prime minister, and the prime minister was Lumumba, and Lumumba. Uh, wanted to uh, basically get help against these uh, th this other group that was fighting in the country. And so Lumumba appealed to the USSR for help. That crosses a line in the Cold War. And Lumumba then, basically, because there are Soviet, USSR, Russian, some people say, advisors and military people in the country, uh, he ends up being the enemy of the CIA. The CIA was very concerned that Congo, which again, today it's the Democratic Republic of Congo, that that country would become communist just like Cuba had become communist. And so they sent out messages that we should support uh, the other group against Lumumba and uh, the, the general of the forces is Mobutu. Mobutu is the general. Eventually, Lumumba is captured. He you know, is fleeing because he's now, even though he was prime minister, he is a rebel and he's captured and he's executed. And that doesn't make people happy. They're still fighting. And so finally, there was a coup d'etat, coup by Mobutu. And Mobutu became the dictator of the country uh, all the way until the 1990s. And so this shows a pattern in Africa. And uh, so the country in 1971, so 1965, Mobutu became the leader. And then in 1971, uh, this you know Republic of Congo became Zaire. And uh, it was led by Mobutu. And so from 1971 until the 1990s, he was the ruler. And uh, finally he was put down, but the, the 20 years plus that he was a leader had devastating effects on Zaire and today the Democratic Republic of Congo. And so today you have the RC, the Republic of Congo, which was the, the French Congo, and the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, which was the Belgian Congo. And they often have trouble with one another and and they are on the verge of of having a war with one another so the congo is again it's a part of this heart of darkness and this legacy of shadows of injustice that i want us to be aware of From this, we can also talk about other things that happened in the 1990s related to African unrest. And <clears throat> a big part of this has to do with ethnic, racial boundaries and groups that go back hundreds and even thousands of years. There are two main groups in Rwanda and Burundi and Uganda. And these, these small nations, Uganda is a little bit bigger, but these nations have common ethnic groups and so it shows how artificial the drawing of borders can be the majority group has been the hutus and the minority group was the tutsis now the tutsis generally had a little bit more privilege and education over the years and when there were these revolutions and and the move for independence Basically, the Tutsis saw the writing on the wall and they fled. They had to go into exile, mostly. Uh, they were persecuted because, they remember, they had been the small minority that was in power 
even though they were persecuted, they still had power when they moved, especially in the nation of Burundi. And what ended up happening was the Tutsis uh, tried to get rid of, of Hutus that were there, and 50,000 Hutus were killed. So the Tutsis were aggressors. They were trying to keep from being uh, killed. And so both sides were guilty. And this continued even into the 1990s. That was in the 1970s that, 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 it, that it happened in Burundi, but it continued into the 1990s. In 1993, uh, there were assassinations of uh, uh, Tutsis. And then Tutsis uh, did try to kill some, some Hutus. But what ended up happening in Rwanda in particular, because of the massive majority of Hutus, a million Tutsis were killed. And this is through this war that was going on between these groups, the Hutus and the Tutsis uh, in the early 1990s. And because the Hutus had power, they wanted more power. They wanted to cleanse their land of Tutsis Again, the Tutsis to them represented people in their past that had represented them, that had that had represented them and repressed them as a minority group. And so it's kind of a revenge story. And so we call all of this the Rwandan genocide. It's true that both sides were guilty, but in the end, it was largely uh, the Tutsis that were exterminated in Rwanda. Let's talk now briefly about Nigeria, because Nigeria, again, is a kind of microcosm. Micro means small, cosm means universe. And so when we have a microcosm, it's a representative of everything else. It's a symbol of what's going on throughout Africa. Nigeria is very resource rich. It has rich oil reserves. And uh, it was controlled by the British during the 1800s. And as a result, the British believed that one of their responsibilities in their colonies was to govern well and to provide education. And they did provide education for many uh, native Nigerians. Uh, in fact, the first bishop of the Anglican Church in Africa was Samuel Ajayi Prowther. And he was an, an African, a black African bishop in the Anglican Church. This shows that there was a difference, that there wasn't this same sense that black Africans could never do what white Africans were doing and what uh, white colonizers, white colonists were doing. And so Crowther uh, was a symbol of what could happen in the colonies. And there were many missionaries, Anglican missionaries, other missionaries. And as a result, Nigeria has a, has a very large Christian population, but they also have a large Muslim population. Now, in 1960, remember, that was the year of Africa, and Nigeria was in the thick of that, gaining its independence from Britain. And they did it in a fairly peaceful way. Uh, they were allowed to be a, a part of the British Commonwealth, and so they, they continued to uh, have Queen Elizabeth II, the current Queen of England. She was the Queen of Nigeria. And so that shows that, you know, independence and, and a new beginning could happen without a bloody, terrible revolution. But unfortunately, there would be a lot of blood spilled in years to come. Now, in the country that, became, that, that was Nigeria, remember, borders are artificial. You had Northerners who were largely Muslims. You had uh, Easterners that were the... Uh, the Igbo people, and then you had the Yoruba people in the West. And so you had different groups. And in the South, largely, you had Christians. So in the North, Muslims. In the South, Christians. Uh, and so uh, this is setting up for political factions that can't agree on, on how the country should be managed. And then it, it goes back to racial or religious differences. And that led to a very violent civil war during the 1960s. And, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people 
uh, died as a result of that civil war. Finally, you have the country of Kenya. And we also say Kenya, so it's okay if you say it either way. I'm trying to say it as I've heard it in, uh, in ways pronounced by the people who live there. So Kenya uh, was the country, and it, again, it was controlled by the British, and it was a, a land of different groups that wanted different political solutions for uh, colonization. And so uh, one group was the, the Mau Mau group, okay? Now Mau Mau was, apparently it meant our grandfathers, our ancestors, and it was this kind of call to say, we need to get rid of the colonizers. And it was a very tribal group uh, wanting more traditional ways in Kenya. And so there was the Mau Mau uprising and it cost uh, 55 million pounds to deal with this uprising. And it was eventually put down. But one of the leaders of the Mau Mau uprising was Kenyatta. His name is Kenyatta. And uh, because of his role in the uprising, he was put in prison for uh, several years. Uh, very similar to Nelson Mandela in South Africa, who was put in prison. But eventually, as times changed and, and the UK realized that it just could not afford tens of millions of, of British pounds to, to settle problems, uh, you know, they, the British had used a strategy of divide and conquer. They wanted to, div to keep groups from uniting, but gradually Kenyatta became a person who uh, could be supported by the black majority and also the white minority because he eventually he promoted reconciliation. This is what Nelson Mandela did and gained a lot of, of white minority support in South Africa as well. Uh, well, Kenyatta became president and unfortunately he became very authoritarian as a result and he just wanted one party rule in Kenya and because he did this and because of the cronyism that developed again cronyism cronyism has to do with the word crony cronies are friends but it's kind of a negative connotation when you call someone a crony it's like a friend that gets benefits just because they're your friend and usually through illegal means and so cronyism developed where in Kenyatta's government certain people got uh, bonuses and benefits and became rich and that corruption is a legacy that Kenyatta had so on one hand he had a legacy of of trying to establish reconciliation and good government but on the other hand he was oppressing political parties and he was guilty of cronyism and corruption well that paints a picture of Africa. And unfortunately, we might be left with the idea that Africa is is always going to have these negative shadows. First of all, we need to take responsibility as citizens of countries that have benefited from a European government and maybe European ancestry. And that is something that weighs hev heavily on my soul. We need to know that the problems created in these former colonies they linger today, not because those people are, are just incapable of governing. It's because of this oppression and this education that taught those people that they had to do things a certain way. We need to take some responsibility. We can't solve everyone's problems and everyone inherits their own sinful nature. But it's important that we know that Africa is a land of hope. It's a land that can use its resources to have a new dawn and a great future. Thanks for watching.